Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 63, Medieval Places of Seeing. In each season of the podcast I've produced one episode that's a bit different from the straight historical narrative. Near the beginning of season one, in episode three in fact, I attempted to imagine what the experience of going to the theatre in ancient Athens might have been like. And as a final episode for season two, I followed a couple and their servants as they made their way across Rome to the theatre of Pompeii. These are fictional accounts, but based on many of the facts and assumptions that I've discussed in the podcast episodes. They were fun to put together, and I'm pleased to say are two of the most frequently downloaded episodes in the back catalogue. So, I thought it would be a good way to once again conclude a season on the podcast by presenting medieval theatre in a similar way. Life, as it tends to do, got in the way on this occasion, and I didn't have time to write the episode as I concluded on medieval theatre, but I've done so now, so here, as a belated coda to season three, is that episode. It's a fiction again, and a personalised view, but I hope you enjoy it nonetheless. Coming next is season four of the podcast. I look forward to your company then, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can always contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. We had walked for days. The cold of winter was biting hard into our bones, and it seemed an age since our feet were warm, but we trudged on. We had no choice. A player has little control over his life, and we were following orders. Well, following them as best we could. We were a troop of six, seven if you count the donkey. Edward was our leader, a man of fifty years, and all of these spent in the theatre. His parents were travelling players, and he always claimed that his first part was as the baby Jesus in the old nativity play. And we had no reason to doubt him. In my experience, there was not a part that he couldn't recite from memory at the slightest prompting. Next to him, I was a mere novice with just five years' experience, having taken up the craft almost by accident when my family fell on hard times and I had to find my own way in the world. Two lads younger than I, Thomas and another Edward who we called Ned, and the older Jerome made up our acting troupe. Between us, we divided out the parts as best befit our age, station and experience. The young lads took the young female roles and the smaller male parts. I usually had the young hero parts, soldiers, sometimes a devil's assistant, and filled minor parts too. Jerome played older women, the devil, wicked uncles and the like, while Edward took on the older men, God, when when we needed him, and other lead roles. It was he who decided what we played and how parts were allocated. He was our leader, there was no doubt about that. The sixth member of our company was the woman who we called Cat. I know nothing of her history and Edward made it very clear that acquainting myself with it was not to be contemplated. She was, he also made clear, out of bounds to all of the troop and not because she was his property. If they had ever had knowledge of each other, well, it was something I'd never seen a hint of. And through Edward, we respected her. He had literally kicked the seventh member out of the troop last summer for trying to force himself on Cat, and had no problem explaining his actions to our master. The memory of our former fellow limping off into the forest, blood streaming from a cut above his eye, and with his future now even more uncertain than that of a travelling player, was enough to keep us all in line as far as Cat was concerned, even the young lads. And she cooked well, sewed, on occasion nursed, and was always repairing clothes for us. And, I have to admit, on occasion when one of our number was ill or a play demanded it, she sometimes acted on the stage too. It was always strange to see a woman on stage with us, even one disguised to look like a man playing a woman. We knew, of course, but the audience were always fooled by the disguise, and Edward's clever staging that kept her away from any brightly lit spots or a close-up with the audience. So there we were, six and a donkey an old and sickly beast, the only sort that could be spared from the work on the estate, walking through the cold and dark of winter. We'd been sent out by our master to join the birthday celebrations of his good friend Sir James Audley, with instructions to then travel by our wits and under the authority of his pass to wherever we might find grainful work, timing our return home for the Christmas season 
ready for the revels that our master would expect. Our tour started very well, and we enjoyed the hospitality of Sir James. We left well supplied with victuals, enough for two or three days thanks to the generosity of Sir James's cook, but those were now long gone, and our chances for performance and therefore a chance to earn our next meal had been few and far between. We'd first stopped at a village just a day's journey from the warmth of the hospitality of Audley Hall, but we found no warm welcome there. The village was mostly dark, with the inhabitants all behind doors firmly shut. At the local inn, we took lodgings in a barn rather than taking rooms that would have cost us more than double what we paid. The barn wasn't exactly cosy, but we were grateful for the roof over our heads as the nighttime frost descended. We huddled around a small fire in one corner and ate from the provisions we had carried while we waited for the water to boil so we could make a warming drink from the herbs we'd gathered on the roadside. The landlord assured us that there was no chance of gathering an audience in this place. Not only was the cold keeping people indoors, but there was a rumour of illness from several of the villages close by and no one would take the chance of gathering in a company of strangers. We told him from whence we had come, and that we had no sign of pestilence, but he shook his head and regretted that such assurances would make no difference at all. But if we returned another time, he would be happy to negotiate a fee for us to use his courtyard for a performance. For just an extra tuppence, he bought us over a jar of ale, which eased us, I have to say, into an unexpectedly early and reasonably comfortable sleep. So, on the landlord's advice, we headed north which took us away from our intended route, but also away from the villages that might be infected with plague. The roads were frozen solid, which actually made our progress quicker than when we had to push our cart through mud all the time, but, being away from our planned route, we lost our way badly and were forced to spend an uncomfortable night sleeping in the cart by the side of the road. Two of us stood watch in turns, for it was by no means a safe thing to do, but when the darkness falls there is no hope of finding your way on a strange road. A turn can be missed in a moment, and travellers find themselves on a moor or a bog or even in a river before they know it. That night we ate the last of our food and huddled together under the oilskins that kept the props dry and covered ourselves with the costumes to keep us as warm as we could. It was a bitter night, and we rose early, little rested, in the hope of finding more comfortable lodgings and some breakfast soon. We are all used to working for two or three hours before we breakfast, but by the time we'd found our way to the next town, it was well past midday, and we were again cold and hungry. In fact, it was the tolling of the Angelus bell that told us that we were coming near to some habitation. We heard the distant bells as we topped a ridge, and then shortly after saw that there was a town in the valley below. Still some distance off, but the sight of it and the downward slope raised our spirits. We walked on, and as we got closer, left the open heath behind us and wound our way by the side of strips of cultivation. All just turned earth cracked by the cold at this time of year, so no locals out in the fields to help guide us. Past the fields and closer to the town, there were some small patches of common grazing where we saw some goats and pigs and one or two cows. It must have been an hour or more past midday when we smelt the town drain and knew that we were close to the walls. Piles of waste lay by the side of the road, which then wound past ditches and streams that trickled with animal and human waste and excrement. The night soil had been dumped hours ago, but the fresh piles still steamed in the cold air. Edward spoke to one of the unfortunates whose job it was to rake the piles and clean the channels and happily ascertained that the town was open, there was no report of plague there and that we would be welcome. As we came closer, we met empty carts leaving the town. It had been market day, and the traders who had sold out of their stock in the morning were making their way to their homes, something of a mad dash this time of year to beat the early falling of the night. One, who still had some tired-looking turnips on his cart, was happy to sell them to us for a penny, and advised us to head for a church on the edge of town, which, he assured us, had a priest that would help us find a performance place. We made our way quickly, the thought of warm boiled turnips filling us with an unreasonable amount of pleasure and hopefulness. The town was quiet, but that didn't deter us. This time of year, these early days of December, are quiet. With little to do in the field and in the cold, people find tasks to do indoors, checking their larders, perhaps still curing the last of the meat that was butchered in the autumn, perhaps worrying about how little grain is left in the bags, or wondering how the rats or the weevils had got into them, and how much was spoilt, 
how many months of limited food the family had to look forward to. The busiest spot was the bakehouse, where the baker was still working on the last of the day's loaves. Several women waited patiently for the miracle of the flour they'd left there earlier being transformed into bread. They all leant against the warm wall of the bakehouse to help keep out the cold, looking up and down the road and gossiping about what they saw. Always first to see an opportunity, Edward told us to quickly grab whatever costumes we could and set up a short procession in front of the cart. These gossips, he assured us, will be the best advertising we can get for today's performance. We were a motley mixed crew as we progressed down the street. I had found Noah's beard and staff and smock. The young lads had the Queen's dress and the nun's wimple. Jerome had found a devil's costume, Lucifer's mask, and Cat had a shepherd's crook and a rough jerkin. Edward had somehow got into the jester's costume quicker than any of us and was already atop the cart, and as we moved down the street he improvised bands for a show of uncertain content and no known location. He promised the nativity, always a good choice at this time of year, and the shepherd's play that is certain to be enjoyed by all. He made vague mention of kings and queens, bad uncles and wicked stepmothers, of young love denied, of vices and virtues, in a never-ending battle. Comic troublemakers and foolish cowards were also promised. As we passed the bakery, he jumped from the cart and addressed his lines to the women, promising them a good time with a wink and a nod. He saved his best lines for the baker's wife, who had come to the door of the shop, promising to whisk her away from the drudgery of life for an evening to take her to mystical lands filled with exotic characters. He is very good at the bands and quite charismatic, and his attentions were rewarded as she slipped him a fresh loaf of bread with a smile. He jumped back onto the cart with a wave and promised to return with details of the venue as we left them behind us. All that activity had warmed us up, but the smell of the bakery had only increased our hunger, reminding us of our missed breakfast. Fortunately, we found the church around the next corner and the priest was at home in a small cottage attached to the main building. He greeted us warmly and allowed us to use an outhouse where we quickly set up a fire and began to cook those turnips. As we waited for food, we took in our surroundings. The church was small, certainly not the main parish of the town, but probably just serving a small part nearby and maybe some outlying homes beyond the city walls. It was a simple building, with just one clear window in the east wall, a dozen rough-hewn pews and a small stone altar. We prayed there briefly, thankful for our safe delivery from the journey. The church, the priest's house, the barn and the outhouse that was our temporary home formed the sides of the square of the cobbled yard. As it had just a narrow entrance between the church and the barn, I could see Edward eyeing it up as a potential performance space, but when the priest came out he made clear that this was not possible. He was actually very enthusiastic about our visit and regretted that he could not help more, but he pointed out times had changed and to allow players in the churchyard would be frowned upon by his superiors and he could not take a chance of losing his only living, which, poor as it was, was all he had. We could only nod and agree to this. We had noticed the plainness of the church, how the statues and paintings had been removed. Changing times, indeed. The priest said that he thought the bishop would allow players in the parish and he could send a boy with a note to him today to ensure his approval, but we would probably have to perform miracle plays or morality, nothing secular. He was also sure that the bishop would send one of his men to check up on what we were doing. We agreed, of course, well used in these times to fitting in with the local sensibilities. The priest went off to dispatch his note and to confirm a venue with a local landlord, promising to return soon. Edward was quick to set his plan. We would perform the Annunciation, John the Baptist and then the Shepherd's Play, the one that ended with the Nativity. This all suited the coming season. Then plays from the life of Christ. Jerome suggested adding the harrowing of hell, which he always does because he plays Lucifer and it's a great opportunity for him to lord it over the rest of us. And young Ned likes it too because he runs a mock through the audience as a devil's assistant and he loves to poke his stick at people, scare them and size up the younger ladies in the audience. Edward soon batted down both ideas. He pointed out that as it seemed we had landed in a town that had embraced the new austere church, the harrowing might be seen as a little too Catholic for our likely audience. We ran through some other ideas of the old miracle plays, but could find little that we felt was safe enough, so Edward settled on a morality play that we occasionally performed that involved the struggle of man against the seven deadly sins and the triumph of the cardinal virtues faith, hope and charity. 
He said that we would then make a break in the place for refreshment and setting of the stage, and with a bit of luck the bishop's men would leave, and we could then present some of the comic interludes that we'd recently performed for Sir James Audley and his guests. These were always much appreciated by the crowd, even if they were not enjoying courses of good food between each play. The thought of those interludes took me back to our last night with Sir James. It had been quite a feast that we'd seen passing by us to the tables as we waited for our next performance. The sugared almonds and the honey mustard hard-boiled eggs were already set on the table, but then came the pea, ham and leek pottage carried in, and that was just the start. After our first interlude, trays of roasted meat were lifted past us. The best cuts were put at the top table, of course. There was chicken and duck and peacock. But the centrepiece was the suckling pig, which we'd seen on the spit in the open fires of the kitchen while we waited for our appointed hour. After more performances came fish, eel and tench, I believe, and then apples and berries and spiced wine. We then concluded the evening with our most daring and bawdy interludes. It was such a sumptuous meal. You see now why we were so grateful even for the leftovers the next day. I was lost in my musings until the digestion of turnips and the return of the priest disturbed me. He scurried back across the yard, looking very pleased with himself, and spoke to us, but looked at Edward. He'd worked out the dynamic of our little group. He told us that his bishop had given permission for the players' troupe to perform once he had been assured of the content of the plays, but he had insisted that the priest vouch for the content, so we should have to recite the plays we were to perform for the priest before the evening. This we readily agreed to. In fact, it was a smaller obstacle than those that often faced us in pursuit of our trade, and we clearly had the old priest on our side. But he warned us that the bishop would still send men to keep an eye on us tonight. He had also spoken with the keeper of a local inn, with a fine courtyard who was happy for us to use the space for a performance, for a share of the entrance fee, of course. Edward would have to go and see him to agree the price. With this news, Edward leapt into action, issuing orders like a commander in the field. Time was of the essence, if we were to be ready to perform later that day. Edward, Jerome and the priest would go and see the innkeeper. Myself and the others would sort out the costumes that we needed for the night, with Cat managing any running repairs that were required. Next, we would run through the plays quickly for the priest's benefit, and Edward subtly made it clear that this would include the mystery plays and the morality only, not the interludes. They were not to be mentioned. Then we had to announce the plays to the town, so we would get into costume, disperse in pairs, and read the bands as widely as we could. We set to work quickly sorting out the costumes, which always got messed up in transportation and with their frequent use for an extra bit of warmth. Cat, who'd taken up a position under cover, but in the best light that was possible in a dull winter afternoon, soon had a small pile of repairs to see to. We almost had all the costumes in good order when Edward returned, with the good news that he'd struck a deal with the landlord. He had asked for a small fixed fee and then a share of our takings. This was a common arrangement, as was the presence of the landlord's own man to sit at the entrance of the courtyard. Ostensibly, this was to refuse entry to any known troublemakers that we, as strangers, wouldn't recognise. Although this was not unwelcome, we all knew that the arrangement was really so that the landlord would have eyes he trusted on the takings, and would thereby know what his share should be. We couldn't blame him for this. We actors have a bad reputation, and are often regarded as little more than thieves and vagabonds. For many, our letters of passage from a respected landowner made little difference. But the arrangement was acceptable, and we had a secret weapon. Edward would ensure that it was Cat who would sit on the gate to collect the entrance fee, and she was skilled at both sleight of hand and charming men to distract them when necessary. Edward would be confident that at least a little extra profit would be our cream from the churn today. With arrangements made and the costumes ready, it was time to run through the plays for the priest. We sat in a circle around a small fire, and on Edward's instruction recited our lines in quick time and without pause. The priest only needed to hear the content, not see a performance. He could pay for that later if he wished. As we recited the shepherd's play, he watched us all like an eagle with a rabbit in its sights. His eyes gleamed in the firelight and then took on a glazed expression. We were about halfway through the nativity when he raised his hand and called us to stop. 
We thought for a moment that he'd found fault with our words, but he simply said that he had heard enough and was happy that we would not overstep any theological boundaries. He then surprised us all and himself, I think, by wiping a tear from his eye. It is great to see such good work again. I know I can trust you, he said after a moment, and it brings back such memories for me. I was a boy here some sixty summers past when these plays were performed in the town in the way that they always used to be. I can still remember the excitement of seeing the preparations. I was just an inquisitive lad with nothing particular to do then, and when I was spotted watching one of the pageant wagons being painted, the men working on it set me to odd jobs for them. The next day, at the councillor who was in charge of the celebrations came to see how they were progressing. He was severe and criticised some of their work, getting them to lay another coat of dye here and there, while reminding them that their work was for the glory of God. I kept a low profile, which was not low enough, for he spotted me and ordered me to take a message to the men who were erecting a stage in the marketplace. I ran there as fast as I could and was amazed at the transformation of the square. At one end, the usual stalls had been moved so that they were all squashed up together at the other end of the square, which led to much bickering amongst the traders. In their place was a large stage that took the whole length of the side of the marketplace, made up of three wagons pushed together. The stage was high, maybe seven or eight feet from the ground. It was only partly built and I could see that there was a wooden frame supporting the stage that would be covered with cloths to hide the space underneath. On the stage itself, a hole was being cut in the wood, which, I didn't know it then, but would be a trapdoor used for Lucifer to rise from hell. At one end of the stage, there was a scaffold that was being covered with white and gold cloth, and there were wooden cutouts in the shape of clouds ready to be suspended above. I could guess that this would be heaven, and that an actor playing God would be seated there. This is true, said Edward. This is still the form we follow today, although not in such a grand style. And then next, there was a city wall, or a lake. The old priest dredged his memory for a moment before enlightenment came. It was a city wall, with a gate and turrets painted on the back cloth. There was a space that was the desert, and then another view of city walls. I came to understand that the dome of a Saracen church and the stars on a blue sky meant that this was Jerusalem itself. That is so, said Edward, and in days past this was not just a painting on a cloth, but a working gateway and walls so realistic that you could easily believe that you had travelled to the holy city itself. <laughs> I do wish I had seen those days. It's true, said the old priest with a sigh, even this small effort the town made was a grand thing. There were council members who could still remember the festivals as they used to be, and they guided the work. They persuaded the bishop to pay for items of scenery, and the young priests were set to work looking at old texts, making changes when they were necessary, and making fresh copy for the parts the actors would use. All of this was just as it would have been in the old days. Merchants and shopkeepers were persuaded to contribute too, and to form the cast of the plays. I became part of those preparations, running messages from one group to another, helping to find materials and tools as they were needed, that sort of thing. For two weeks the whole town was alive with the thrill of the preparations. In halls and rooms and any space available, people rehearsed their parts. Mostly this was done before the working day for an hour or two at most. It was a lot to learn, interrupted Edward. In the past all these parts were known from performance year by year, with only a few changes at a time. I think this was not so hard as it is for a cast who had to learn the parts from scratch. We hear how spectacular the plays were in the past, how rain was made to pour over the stage as Noah loaded the ark, how the staff of Moses burst into flower, how the devil himself seemed to enter from hell, how people could think that Jesus really had been crucified again, so effective was the blood and the water gushing from the holy wounds. In the moment he took to cross himself, the old priest picked up his reminiscences again. By now, we'd all stopped any preparations to listen to him. Even Cat's Needle was still as he resumed his story of the glory of the theatre of the past. Sadly, our efforts were not so grand. The devils from hell had some fireworks, the farrier provided hot coals for the mouth of hell, and the tanner some putrid liquids of such stench that it felt like your nose was turning inside out. But there was no art, just a few painted animals on cloth, no ascent into heaven, and Jesus was quite obviously tied to the cross. It was a shadow of the past, but still a wonderful event for the town.
The night before Corpus Christi, every group had to give a performance for the council members and the bishop's men, just as they would have to do the following day for the townspeople. I heard that there were moments when the bishop's men insisted on cuts and changes to the scripts, and some argued about the look of the set or how their money had been spent on this costume or that effect, but eventually it was agreed that all was well, and the bishop entertained the council members with a lavish meal to open the celebrations, and the cast and stage builders and costume makers were offered food and drink in the gardens of the bishop's palace. Forgetting myself for a moment, I grunted a laugh. (laughs) Bishops always like to take the credit when they know they can attach their name to a success. Edward scowled at me. We still needed this priest as an ally, but he seemed not to be offended, and just nodded slowly, and continued lost in his remembrance. Corpus Christi itself was a wonderful day. I followed all the performances. We started early with the creation and Adam and Eve by the Abbey Gates, and then walked into town, accompanied by Abraham and Moses and some musicians. As we got closer to town, the crowd grew and grew. We stopped near this very place for the play of the prophets, and then on again we went further down this very road you'll shortly travel. In St Mark's Square, not half a mile from here, we saw the Annunciation and the play of John the Baptist, and then moved again to the marketplace for the Nativity and the plays of the life and the passion of Christ. The whole square was full of people. Hawkers and traders had been pushed to one side, and the streets cleverly closed off so that there was only one way into the square, and a penny could be collected from everyone who entered. Near the stage, seating had been placed for special guests, and those who'd paid a little more. The clergy and the council had placed themselves near the heaven end of the stage, while others with less influence sat less comfortably nearer to hell. They would soon have their faces covered when the devils appeared amongst them, spreading fear and bad smells. Once we had seen the stories from the life of our Lord Jesus and hell had been harrowed, the bishop led us in prayer and we all sung the Te Deum. It was a beautiful thing, he added with a sigh. But not repeated since, I'll warrant, said Edward, getting up from his stool. That is true, said the priest. Afterwards, there was a story that the bishop was called to London and reprimanded for allowing the celebrations. And both the people and the church are so concerned with money these days that there's no chance of putting on such a grand show again. God knows the way the king is taken from the church. It is the only thing that should concern us. There will soon be nothing left to inspire the people to God's true way. He stopped abruptly and peered around as if looking for an eavesdropper who might report his unguarded words. Edward nodded him some reassurance of our silence, but the spell of his reminiscence was broken. Those days were gone, and we needed to get organised and to prepare for our own much more meagre offering and earn our supper. The courtyard of the inn was perfect, similar to many that we had performed in before, so we quickly saw how we could throw up a backcloth to provide us with an attiring space and how the entrance could be manned. In fact, the innkeeper's man was already there in position, keeping a watchful eye on us. The innkeeper provided some benches and we positioned them so we would be able to accommodate four rows of spectators on three sides of the courtyard, one standing, one sitting on benches and two more crouched or sat on the ground. With all in place and Cat left to guard our interests out front, we prepared ourselves and then went out in pairs reading the bands for the show, with strict instructions from Edward to get as far as we could but to make sure we returned in time to prepare properly for our opening. And so there I was, stood in a narrow space behind a curtain, listening to Edward reciting the prologue of the play, waiting for my moment to step onto stage. I had listened to the audience coming in, even risked a peek from behind the curtain. All was ready, and we had gathered a decent crowd of people. Cat was collecting money as people walked in, and talking amiably to the innkeeper's man, so all was well. If all went to plan, I could look forward to an innkeeper's meal tonight, and a decent ale to wash it down but any feelings from my emptying stomach were overridden by the anticipation of acting the parts and hearing the reaction of the audience. That same feeling that actors through the ages, right back to the all but lost times of ancient Greece, they say, must have felt just as I do. The thrill, the anticipation and the reward. It's a heady mix. And I gave a silent thanks to God so as not to forget that all of this is his doing and we are but vessels for his desires. And we did put on a good show. 
The audience came with us to laugh with the shepherds, to marvel at the grandeur of the wise men, and to relive the birth of Christ our Saviour. I could see and sense that we had the audience with us, from the oldest to the youngest. At the close of the plays, Edward recited the epilogue, praising God for the gift of his son and calling a short break in the proceedings. It had been such a good evening that he ordered a jug of weak ale from the innkeeper so as we might revive ourselves as we waited. I spied him speaking to the priest who had joined the audience and who was able to point out the bishop's men. Next, we played the morality to reveal to all the triumph of faith, hope and charity over the darkness of the many vices of men. This time, I could sense that the audience were restless. The children were getting tired and no doubt found this play much more like a church service than theatre and the poorer for it. Perhaps a tear was shed by a few at the death of mankind, but I fear the morality play will never be liked as the miracle plays are. Their time will pass quickly, I'm sure, and something new will come along. We are living in difficult and dangerous times, but God will guide us to a better place. The play finished and many left to get their children to bed or themselves in anticipation of an early and cold start the next morning. As Edward had hoped, the bishop's men also left and with a nod to the innkeeper he quickly announced that we would play on with a selection of interludes that had entertained the gentry in many great houses. He turned to us, told us to prepare quickly and to be bold and fearless on the promise of a hearty supper. So we finished the evening with stories of love denied and found of foolish servants who could best their masters, of greedy monks and of scheming priests, of lords overcome with hubris and defeated by greed. We finished on a Christmas tale of a mean old man who at last learnt the true meaning of Christmas through the love of a child. A perfect end. The ale had been flowing very freely all evening, and as the audience went home happily entertained, the innkeeper thanked us for the extra business and his share of the income, and served us a very welcome meal that we ate late into the night. Little did he realise just how much clever Cat had deducted from his share. If he ever thought he had been shortchanged, and perhaps he would once his man realised that the other promises Cat had made to him for the night would not be fulfilled, well, we would be long gone by then. At length we walked back to our meagre lodgings with our cart and the priest, checked on the donkey and prepared to sleep so we would be ready to set off again tomorrow. Could you not stay, asked the priest, almost pleading, to have actors resident in the town, to have the chance of theatre whenever it was wanted, would be truly wonderful. Edward laughed. What an idea, to stay in one place and perform week after week the different plays of the season. That would be a happy place, but it's not the way of the world. There is an open road ahead of us, calling to us. There is a master we must answer to, and others who need to see our plays. Rejoice in what you have seen, dear father, and pray that you shall still be alive when we return in a year or two, for we shall surely descend on you again. They laughed and embraced, and, continued Edward, I would not be so sure that your bishop would not get wind of our little extra performance tonight, and would come after us soon. I have no wish to spend a day or two in the public stocks, so please, be careful yourself, and should anyone ask, tell them we have gone. We are headed south. We said our good nights and gave the old priest our heartfelt thanks. We slept but briefly, and were on the road again before dawn, heading firmly north, an acting troupe, in search of our next audience. <laughs>